Um, although I want to talk more about the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. I've titled this message, The Spirit of Adoption, but it's really uh, uh, more than that. Um, but although it does talk about adoption in verses uh, 15 and 16, it's really, Romans chapter 8 is really about everything that the Holy Spirit uh, gives to us and brings to us in salvation. And so, so that's why it's, it's such a, a grand chapter that a lot of promises of God are in, in Romans chapter 8 that are very, very dear to us. And so in verse 2, the chapter started out, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So we're going to be talking about freedom and about adoption. Someone put it this way, mankind is really free only in God, the source of his freedom. I'll say that again. Mankind is really free only in God, the source of his freedom. We live in a current culture that proudly declares, be your true self. Would you agree? Be true to yourself. You do you. I, ha I did a double take the first time I heard someone talk about, we live in a you do you culture. Went from Nike, you know, just do it, to you, you do you. <laughs> but I think the slogans are getting shorter and shorter. But that's the kind of cultural attitude we live in, is that, well, you be yourself. You be true to yourself. You find the best version of yourself. Uh, there's a book by a professor at Grove City College in Pennsylvania named Carl Truman. I believe he's from Scotland, and he co-wrote a book with another author. The title is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And it tracks the cultural path of how in America, especially in, in, in general in Western culture, you, you, there's been this emphasis over the last 70 years on the self, the modern self. And so that brings with it a whole host of questions. So one question then is, is a person most free when he or she is an autonomous individual without any other restraints? Or is a person most free when he or she is on the path to what God designed? I think we would answer biblically that a person is most free, a person is most their true self when they are the self that God has designed them to be. We are all being conformed to the image of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about how we are, we are to exercise our gifts in the body of Christ so that the whole body may attain to maturity and the fullness of Christ. Is true freedom activated or achieved by being yourself, being an island, being invincible, being a captain of your own fate, or is it in relationship to God? As an aside, uh, I heard this Summary, which I think is very apropos to where our society is. Uh, this one person put it this way. He said, the culture says your main problems are outside of you, mainly being other people. <laughs> the, the problem is these people over here or this institution here or this system over here. And, and, but the answer is find the truth in yourself, find the power in yourself to overcome these problems that are outside of you. That's what the culture says. But the gospel says, your main problem is right here. Right here. Lieber, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Libra, but he, he, uh, was, we were talking about this on Thursday, and he was talking about sharing his heart about, do I, do I care enough to, to really, uh, you know, do a project like this and care about refugees around the world, do I really, do I really care? And I, I said, well, Leroy, I think, I think you do care. You know, and he said something to the effect of, but do I really care about anybody other than Leroy Mickelson? Mm. 
And I think that summarizes the dilemma of sin in our own hearts, right? Is that the gospel says, wait, your biggest problem, your biggest struggle is right here. And the answer isn't finding it within yourself to solve these other things outside of you. The answer is receiving the Spirit of God from outside of yourself, which gives you the power and the heart to change. So that's just an aside, which I think summarizes the, the attitude of our culture. The culture says, all your problems are mainly out here, but you have your truth within by which you can solve those problems, where the gospel says the opposite. So brothers and sisters, overabundance of finances is not our source of freedom. Self-reliance is not our source of freedom. The right to free speech in this country is not our source of freedom. It's an expression of freedom, but not our source of freedom. The freedom to work, the freedom to create, the freedom to live in different places, that is not the source of our freedom. God is the source of our freedom. What God has done in Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is the source of our freedom. We have freedom in Christ because we are no longer debtors to the flesh. We are set free to serve God, to be led by the Spirit, the one who gives us life. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it says this, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. As a Christian, you are operating under a different law, under a different principle, now that the Holy Spirit is in you. Listen to this metaphor. I hope it helps you think about this verse. A law is a set pattern of how things happen. The law of gravity deems that a heavy slab of concrete will remain where it is placed. Thus, sidewalks stay put. But we have all seen a sidewalk that is heaved up and twisted because once, once upon a time, a small acorn fell between the slabs of the sidewalk and now has grown into a massive oak tree whose roots are powerful enough to move great weight. The law of new growth conquered the law of gravity and moved the concrete. That is what is meant by the triumph of one law over another, such as the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So as a Christian in Jesus Christ, there is a different power, there is a different law at work, and it's the Holy Spirit that changes us, that sets us free. So don't give in to the satanic harassment that says, you'll never please God. Don't give in to that harassment, because you are pleasing to God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. You are, you have the righteousness of Christ by faith, the righteous requirement of the law has been met through Jesus Christ, and you are pleasing to God in Christ Jesus. So don't give in to that harassment. So what's the main point for today? The main point is that Christians are called and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in freedom as adopted sons and heirs of God. Adopted sons and heirs of God. Sons and daughters inclusively. But the emphasis in the New Testament is sometimes on the fact that in the ancient world, the son got the inheritance. The firstborn son got the inheritance. And so when the Bible says you are sons of God, it means that we share in the inheritance that God has given to Jesus, that we share. We are co-heirs with Christ. And so the first picture that we have of that freedom of sonship and heir, being co-heirs with Christ is in verses 12 through 14. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So look at verse 12 through 14 again and just focus on those words. We are debtors not to the flesh. No longer are we debtors to the flesh. We are freed to follow the Holy Spirit and put to death sinful behaviors. That's the first facet of this freedom is that we are free to follow the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit and to put to death 
sinful behaviors. Now, one principle that's at work here is that if you do not make any effort to put to death sinful behaviors, you're not going to be led by the Spirit. And he says that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So one genuine mark of someone who belongs to God is are they putting forth any effort to put sinful deeds uh, to, to death? We are, we are debtors not to the flesh. To whom, okay, so then the question is to whom or what are we debtors? Thank you for asking. We are debtors to the Holy Spirit. One person put it this way. What a great debt we owe to the Holy Spirit. Christ loved us so much, he died for us. The Spirit loves us so much, he lives in us. The Spirit daily endures our carnality and our selfishness. Daily the Holy Spirit is grieved by our sin, yet he loves us and remains in us as the seal of God and the down payment of the blessing waiting for us, of the blessings waiting for us in eternity. Isn't it wonderful that the Holy Spirit puts up daily with our carnality, our selfishness, the Holy Spirit is grieved by our sin, yet he loves us and remains in us. How many of you have experienced a situation where you do something that is uh, sinful or wrong or even just slightly annoying and another person says, I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit lives in you, remains in you and says, I want you to be led by me. I want you to, to yield to me. So we are debtors not to the flesh, but we are debtors in that, in that metaphor to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So there's a setting of the mind. There's a thinking about intentionally. There's a, there's a dwelling on the things of the flesh versus the things of the spirit. Putting, putting aside the, the things of the flesh and dwelling on the things of the spirit. Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. So there's that, there's that contrast. Are we setting our minds on the flesh or are we setting our minds on the Spirit? And then verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So you pick up the tension there. The tension between God is commanding us to do something, but also he's saying, be led by the Spirit. You see the tension? It's kind of like Paul saying in, in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. But how do I be filled with the Spirit? It doesn't say fill yourself or go down, go down to the stream and fill up a bucket. Be filled with how, how do you do something that God says is, is, is the Holy Spirit doing to you? There's a tension there between what God asks us to do, asks us to do, and what God does in us. So here's a summary of that tension. Other people put it better than me, and so I include their words. <laughs> The believer's once-for-all death to the law of sin does not free him from the necessity of mortifying sin in his members, meaning killing sin in his members. The believer's once-for-all death to the law of sin makes it necessary and possible for him to mortify sin in his members. Another one put it this way. Neither the indicative nor the imperative can be severed from one another. They are inextricably connected, meaning neither what God says is true about us because of what he has done or the commands that God gives us about what he asks of us to do. Neither of those can be separated. The point of connection in this passage is the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that set us free from the law of sin and death has taken up residence within us, producing in us the mindset which tends toward doing God's will and resisting the ways of the flesh. I mentioned Philippians chapter 3 last time. I do not say that I have taken hold of it, but I press on to what lies ahead. I press on to make it my own. Why? Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So there's a pressing forward, but there's also a realization that Christ is in me doing his work. So then that brings up the application question of, okay, well, how do you 
by the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. Or Paul says the body here, but uh, the, the majority of the references in this chapter to the flesh refer to everything about us that is opposed to, to God's will. That's generally the way the term flesh is used. The NIV translates it uh, sinful nature. But the, but the basic idea is that everything that's in that still remains in us that is opposed to God, that's, that represents the flesh. So how do we do that? Well, first you pause before you say something. <laughs> uh, somebody, uh, one of my friends quoted uh, James, uh, James chapter 1, uh, I forget if it's chapter 1 or 2, where it says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, uh, in the book of James. And, and I, I replied on there, and I said, yeah, the first step to listening is, uh, is turning off all the electronic <laughs> inputs that you have. <laughs> And actually going outside and having a conversation with another person. <laughs> right? Because we're not really listening to other people if we're just absorbing what the electronic media is feeding us. So ask the Holy Spirit. First, stop and ask the Holy Spirit, would doing this please you right now? Would saying this please you right now? And the Holy Spirit will have that voice that will tell you. Secondly, take common sense measures to avoid people, things, and situations where you are more easily tempted to sin. God gives you, by his Holy Spirit, inspired common sense to the believer. So it's no use saying if you're, uh, if, if you're a recovering alcoholic, it's no use saying, well, I'll just drive by that place. I won't go in. I'll just drive by that liquor establishment. See, a lot of times our attitude towards temptation is we want to see how close we can get to temptation and not give in. That's, that's, that's not the goal. The goal is flee temptation. Run away. Get away. So take common sense measures to avoid people, things, and situations where you are more easily tempted to sin. <laughs> Number three, remind yourself of the fruitlessness of continuing in a sinful behavior. Part of it is we have to train our minds to say, wait a second, Romans 6.21, for what, what did you gain by the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things lead to death. Sin promises temporary pleasure at the cost of longer lasting damage. Sin promises temporary pleasure at the cost of longer lasting damage. So you have to train your mind to say, okay, wait a second. If I do this right now, it may be a sinful temptation. It may be just a, just a response that I'm making, but that's not, that's not bearing fruit. That's not bearing any fruit for good. Fourth, listen to the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Holy Spirit, not the voice of pride. A lot of times when uh, I'm thinking of certain things to say or conversations with people, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, well, how am I going to position myself to come across this way? Or how am I going to convince them to, to accept this idea? Or how am I going to... And a lot of that is the voice of my own either pride or fear or insecurity. Pride and fear are sort of reverse uh, sides of the same coin. There's either a pride there, a self-protection, or a fear, or an insecurity. But when we listen to the Holy Spirit, instead of those voices of self-protection, we'll often be able to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. Scripture memory. By the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. So when you memorize scripture, you're giving, you're, you're yielding to the Holy Spirit and giving the Holy Spirit the opportunity to speak to you in those moments when you're tempted, when that scripture comes back to your mind. Because we can frustrate the Holy Spirit by not yielding to the Holy Spirit. Lastly, make the choice to take up your cross daily and serve Christ and others. Make the choice. There is an intentional choice. 
Am I going to serve myself or am I going to serve Christ and others? And Jesus talks a lot about that in the book of Mark, chapter 8 and 9, taking up your cross, denying yourself, and following him. So that's the first facet, is that the Holy Spirit sets us free to, by the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. Next facet is that the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom and security of adopted children of the Father. Look at verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Daddy. That's the Aramaic word, and then, then the Greek word, pater, for father, be, became uh, used as a, as a, a follow-up word to that Aramaic word. Abba, Father. The same words that Jesus uses in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So notice the contrast here. If we can go to the next slide there. Is there, is there a way to click ahead on that, JJ? Or Thank you, David. Um, the Holy Spirit gives us the freedom and security of adopted children of the Father. So there's a, there, God has not given you a spirit of fear, of, but of power and of love and of self-control. There's a contrast. We no longer have the spirit of slavery. We are no longer under the spirit of fear. We now have the spirit of adoption. What's the thrill of a child who wants to be adopted? The thrill is having security and having someone say, yes, I want you. I want you to be part of our family. I'm choosing you just for you. When they're, when they're by themselves in an orphanage, someone coming along saying, I'm adopting you. You have received the spirit of adoption. There's a contrast here between uh, these, these three verses uh, that, I'll, that I'll show you in addition to Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. If you are adopted as a child of God, you have a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Notice the difference there between the capital S, Holy Spirit, and small letter S, the Spirit of the world. You have not been given this kind of Spirit, but you have been given the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of adoption. It expresses a deep sense of yearning, of trust, of protection, of love, and of tenderness. I remember when our kids were first born and they were very young and I was a first time parent, I was thinking, how in the world am I going to know when they're sick? I, re I, re I don't know why I was nervous about that when, when I was, uh, parenthood was approaching. It's like, how, how am I going to know exactly when we need to take our child to the doctor? And then, you know, other parents would come alongside and they'd be like, you'll know, they'll just be fussy. <laughs> you know, they'll just be fussy, they'll just have a temperature or whatnot. And uh, what are the telltale signs? Well, as a parent, God does, hasn't God given you a God-given instinct to jump in and hold your child when he or she is fussy? I remember uh, one of our children had the croup, and she was, she was awake at night, and, uh, and the croup is that kind of high-pitched cough, you know? And, uh, and we took her to the, to the uh, emergency room that night, and the doctor said, oh, yeah, we've seen this before. You know, he was very reassuring. And, of course, we, we didn't know exactly what it was. But all I wanted to do was hold her in that moment because you wanted to solve, you wanted to solve the problem. You wanted to comfort. You wanted to, to hold her. I'll share with you a humorous story. When, when uh, our kids were infants, we had some friends that we talked to, and, and we were joking about how you know, with young children, you, you can't really sleep in because they're up and ready to go, you know, 6 o'clock, 6.30, whatever, whatever it is. They're up and ready to go. And, and so they were joking, well, it's, you know, it's a bit annoying that we can't sleep in 
uh, because the kids are the kids are up and ready to go. And and uh, they said, you know, our our one daughter, she's old enough now that she can she can. Uh, uh, crawl out of her crib or get out of her, I think they had like a toddler bed, low toddler bed. She's old enough she can get up and walk out and open the door and walk, it, walk out and wake us up. <laughs> and so their solution was this. They wanted to sleep in a little more and so they said, well, we pour a cup of juice at night, a little sippy cup of juice, and we put it outside her door. And so when she wakes up in the morning, she opens the door and she sips the cup of juice, and she's occupied for another 20 minutes before she comes and wakes us up. <laughs> but seriously, as a parent or a grandparent, if your child is in trouble, if your child is suffering or worried or sick or tired or lonely or discouraged, you want to just scoop them up and hold them in your lap. That is a glimpse of the Father's love. And so God tells us that we can cry by the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father. His love gives us the assurance that no one else can give. Now, how do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. There is an inner witness of the Holy Spirit that reassures you that you are a child of God. John Wesley described his conversion founder of Methodism, he described his conversion as going from the faith of a servant to the faith of a son. Just think about that difference. Going from the faith of a servant to the faith of a son. Can you say that this morning? That you have the faith of a little child who trusts and says, "I all of my needs, I have to surrender all of my needs to you, Father. I hope you can say that this morning. And it's as simple as just asking, surrendering your life to Jesus and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, I, I have no hope for eternity without you and your work on the cross and your resurrection and your Holy Spirit within me, teaching me and loving me and training me. He has given us the spirit of adoption. One, uh, one, songwriter I enjoy uh, listening to recently is a songwriter named Jess Ray and she has a song called Runaway here are some of the lyrics to this song entitled Runaway it's kind of a, a, a picture of the prodigal son but it's, this is written from the perspective of God I've seen this all before it's all too familiar but you will never see the bottom of my storehouses of love so as you use the night to make your flight, no choice that you make or path that you take will change my mind. Even if one day you decide you will find somewhere else to hide, I will walk your way and call your name and wait for your reply. Even if you make up in your mind you don't want to be by my side, I will leave behind 99. Oh, that you would be mine. I'm going to leave behind 99 that you would be mine. Even if you stomp and scream and huff and tell me that I'm not good enough, I'll take every swing and every blow until you know my love. Even if you beat upon my chest, tell me that you don't understand, I will love you and teach you to love me again. I'm going to love you and teach you to love me again. Even in the midst of all of our protesting, God says, I want to bring you back to me. Isn't that a picture of the Father's love? The Father waiting for the, his son to come back. Waiting for his son. And the scripture says in Luke 15 that he picked up his robe and he ran to his son. And he put his arms around his neck and he kissed him. God has given us the spirit of adoption. And that's not, that's not all. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. As a kid watching the Brady Bunch growing up, you know, you always, you always felt for Bobby and Cindy, the youngest, right? 
because the youngest didn't get to participate in certain other things. But then every once in a while, you know, the youngest would get special treatment. You don't have to worry about being the youngest in God's family. He says you are heirs. You are co-heirs with Christ. All of God's children are heirs equally with Christ. And so he's given us this inheritance provided or in order that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So the Holy Spirit, the third facet of this freedom is that the Holy Spirit guarantees our inheritance, preserving us in suffering. So it would be wrong to say there is now no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and then say, well, that means no suffering either. Notice how the rest of the chapter really is about suffering and about how nothing can separate us from the love of God no matter what comes. So there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but the reality is there is suffering. There is suffering. And the Holy Spirit guarantees that we will be preserved in suffering. Suffering is the indispensable prelude to glory. It is expected, it is inevitable, and it is required as part of our call to follow Christ, to walk in the same road he walked. That is, suffering is another mark or an indication of assurance. That may seem counterintuitive, but I think the scriptures in the New Testament present it that way. That we are called to suffer. Christ left you an example to suffer. So that we would follow in his steps, the book of 1 Peter says. Notice in John, Jesus' prayer in John 17, where he prays for his disciples and those who would believe on their testimony. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now we can be protected from the evil one and still suffer. I think, I think as Americans, maybe we've gotten that idea that protection from the evil one means nothing bad is going to happen. Talk to Christians in Nigeria. Talk to Christians in North Korea. Talk to Christians in China or Pakistan, other parts of the world. Their suffering is due to persecution. There's all different kinds of suffering, but suffering is inevitable. Everyone who lives, wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There is now no condemnation in Christ, but there is suffering. Matthew chapter 19, verse 20, the rich young ruler. Lord, I followed all the commandments. What do I still lack? Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come... Follow me. And it says the rich young ruler walked away sad. Why was he sad? Well, partly because he loved his possessions more than he loved Christ. But I think also because he knew that even giving up all his possessions, after he did that, he would still have to follow Jesus. He said, go give all your possessions away and then come follow me. And I think the young, rich young ruler knew, okay, well, even if I gave all that away, I would still have to follow Christ, and I'm not willing to pay that price of possible suffering. I don't think he was willing to suffer. At least for him, suffering might have been giving away all his possessions. So the question is, what is the gain? What is the gain? In order that we may also be glorified with him. It's amazing to think about that's not just the resurrection body that believers will have, but I think that's how we share in the glory of Christ. Being glorified with Christ is the gain. Having the inheritance of eternal life, the anticipation of seeing him face to face, the anticipation of a resurrection body, sharing the glory of not even the possibility of sin, and being able to share everything that Christ has. I'll close with this verse, Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, everything he has belongs to you. That's the New Living Translation. I'll read it again. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. 
And since you are his child, everything he has belongs to you. The freedom that the Holy Spirit gives us in adoption and in as heirs of God. Let's praise him and thank him for that today. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we recognize that daily uh, you ask us to choose uh, to put to death uh, the deeds of the flesh, to put to death sinful uh, behaviors. But we also recognize, Lord, we can only do that by your Holy Spirit working in our hearts. If it's simply striving in our own flesh, in our own strength, trying to be better, trying to uh, perform uh, something, it, it's not truly out of a heart of love and obedience uh, to you. And so today, Father, I ask that you would give us the reassurance of the spirit of adoption. However, we have been wounded by um, our earthly families, or whether we've had difficult relationships with our parents growing up or even into adulthood, we yearn to know that we belong in your family, Lord, and you have made it clear in your word that those who are in Christ Jesus, by faith, have the spirit of adoption. And we can say, Abba, Father. And we can, we can just take a deep breath and exhale and know